explain the premise of your newest book, Chief Cultural Officer. Chief Cultural Officer uh, works, uh, begins with the premise that the corporation is now, uh, that things have changed for the corporation, that many of the opportunities it needs to seize are in the world of culture. Many of the blindside hits that it doesn't see coming come from culture. Um, and so it needs a new and more sophisticated understanding of what culture is. The old model for the corporation was one in which um, the corporation could wait for uh, startups to work up a new notion. Uh, and when the, you know, when, the, uh, when the startup got to certain multiples, when it got large enough, you thought, okay, it's tested the market. It's taken a new idea. It's, it's, given it, it's done the meaning management. It's floated the idea. All of these consumers are responding. The test is done. And Coke would then just go ahead and buy Snapple or something, right? So that was the old model. And, and what they didn't get from that system, they got from gurus who would come in and give them the benefit of a cultural point of view. And I think both of those... Uh, methods are, are flawed, uh, not least because things now come so fast and furious. The uh, culture changes so quickly and so often that you, uh, you really need to have your own, your own source. You need to have a sole source within. In the old days, probably corporations used visiting bookkeepers, right? And that was okay. And at some point, the corporation said, geez, you know, fiscal responsibility, responsibility demands that we do this ourselves and that we have professionals and we systematize it and it feels like maybe the corporation uh, might consider looking at culture that way because culture has now become this kind of over, both an opportunity and, uh, and a danger to its uh, well, well-being and to shareholder value. Can you walk us through the process of how brands interact with culture and attain that status of an iconic brand where they actually create meaning in people's lives? So there are five uh, stages to this process by which meaning is manufactured. Um, the first is the general culture, and so the marketer consults uh, consumers, listens to them very carefully, figures out what meanings in that culture matter to the consumer. Uh, in stage two, um, the marketer takes those meanings and begins to unhook them from the general culture and make them uh, exist in the product and the brand, um, which is stage three. Um, so those products and brands go out into the world charged with these meanings. Um, and in stage four, through the act of purchase and use, the consumer buys the, the Coca-Cola, uh, finds in it notions of nationality or gender or, 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 or any number of things, and then through their own process of, of kind of meaning transfer, unhooks those meanings from the product and the, and the brand and, make, and invests them in themselves. Now, this is like the sort of, like for me, the kind of classic notion of what marketing is and, and how it works. And what we've seen happen in the last, what, 10, 15 years is a huge change in the world of marketing as a result of new media and social media and the digital revolution generally. So that now it's the case that uh, consumers are creating many of their own meanings, uh, uh, sourcing those from culture, inventing them, investing them in things. In a sense, the culture's al the consumer has almost taken over that five-stage model. It still, still happens that we have marketing, we have meaning manufacture, but we have consumers in on the game in a ferocious way. And of course, we have new models of, of business from Etsy and from other, other players. And so m many of the, the, uh, the foundational notions of marketing have changed and everybody's now got access to the technology of meaning manufacture. So we've got many more people in the kitchen, many more cooks in the kitchen, many more meanings in circulation. Um, and uh, so it's a much messier and, and kind of more glorious world than it was before. Um, and uh, so it's very much, that classical model is very much under, under transformation. As an example, of this process, mm. um, and you discuss it in your book, Levi's missed completely the urban trend. Right. While mm. Nike, uh, you don't go into it so right. much, but it's a classic case. Right. Nike used it to rise from a, a startup shoe company right. and elevated itself yeah. into the, the stratosphere of the iconic brand. Totally. How do you explain that? Levi Strauss uh, had an awkward moment in uh, the uh, middle 90s when it missed the hip hop trend. Uh, it lost a billion dollars in sales in, in a single year. Uh, somebody on the creative strategic team said, uh, who knew baggy pants were a paradigm shift? Uh, to which the answer is, well, actually that's your job. Um, that's why the world needs people with cultural sensitivities and maybe also a chief culture officer. Um, in, the, in the case of Levi Strauss, uh, jeans maker, they, 
it wasn't like they weren't doing any due diligence. They just had a different model of what marketing should be. And they were using the one-to-one -one marketing model. Remember when we're, people were talking about, oh, now we have the, the productive capacity of, of individualizing or customizing every product for every consumer. Levi's notion, Levi's thought, oh, perfect, this is for us. You come in, you give us your dimensions, you come back in two weeks, we give you the perfect pair of jeans. So they were enamored of this idea and kind of missed that there was a culture in turmoil, in change, and didn't see that, and that sort of struck them as a tsunami. Um, and uh, Nike is a nice kind of uh, point of comparison to the extent that Nike, uh, their big cultural moment was fitness, and not only did they sort of capture that cultural development, they, they helped create it.